The religious system of the later generations of the Samoans differed widely from that of still older generations, and also from the religious worship of the Tahitians and other groups surrounding. They had no idols or teraphim, neither were they accustomed to offer human sacrifices to their idols. Still, they were burdened with superstitions which were most oppressive and exacting. It is difficult to arrive at anything like a clear and connected account of their mythology, as native statements are often vague and conflicting. I give some particulars which I gathered from intelligent natives, and which I think may be relied upon, as I tested them carefully, and moreover, they were the outcome of more than one testimony. These accounts were collected more than fifty years ago, that is, before the natives had had much intercourse with Europeans, and before their records had become mixed and unreliable, as they are likely to have been in later years. The Samoans had several superior divinities and a host of inferior ones, lords many and gods many, and they were also accustomed to deify the spirits of deceased chiefs. In addition to the homage paid to these, petitions were offered and libations of Ava were poured out at the graves of deceased relatives, whilst the war clubs of renowned warriors were regarded with much superstitious reverence, if not actually worshipped, under the name of Anava. Atua, or the original gods who dwelt in Pulotu, a Samoan Elysium, as also Ilelangi, or heavens. Tupua, the deified spirits of chiefs, who were also supposed to dwell in Pulotu. The embalmed bodies of some chiefs were also worshipped under the significant name of Lafa Atua Lalaina, or made into a sun-dried god, as were also certain objects into which they were supposed to have been changed, which were called Tupua, and held to personate them. I, too, a class which included the descendants of the original gods, or rather all deities whose aid was invoked, or whose vengeance might be denounced by the various classes of the priesthood. Of this class of deities, some were supposed to inhabit Pulotu, others held sway in Fafa or Hades, whilst one, Mafui, was supposed to take up his abode in the volcanic region Ilalo, or below, which was called Salafei, of or pertaining to the Fehe. O Sanali'i, which term I think may be said to include ghosts or apparitions. These seem to have been regarded as an inferior class of spirits, ever ready for mischief or frolic, but who do not seem to have been represented by any class of priesthood, or to have had any dwelling sacred to them. The term is also used respectfully for an Aitu, or God. The Atua, or original gods, who are described as dwelling in the Longi, or heavens, were considered the progenitors of the other deities, and believed to have formed the earth and its inhabitants. These original gods were not represented by any priests or temples, neither were they invoked like their descendants. Of the primitive gods, the chief place is assigned to Tangaloa, or as he is sometimes called Tangaloa Langi, Tangaloa of the skies. He was always spoken of as the principal god, the creator of the world, and progenitor of the other gods and mankind. In one tradition that gives an account of the formation of the earth mention is made of other divinities or helpers. Tangaloa Tosi, also styled Nai Tosi, Nai the marker, and Nai Vaavaai, Nai the seer or beholder, also called Tangaloa Vaavaai. These two helpers are introduced as being sent by Tangaloa to complete the formation of the bodies of the first two of mankind and to impart life to them. In this tradition, there would seem to be a remarkable allusion to a trinity of workers, and also what appears to be an indistinct reference to the phenomenon of the elevation of portions of the land by volcanic agency, or, as tradition puts it, the successive elevation of the earth by means of the far-famed fishhook of Tangaloa, described further on. The son of Tangaloa was the Tuli, which is a species of plover. Tuli went down from the heavens to the surface of the ocean, but found no place on which to rest, and returned to complain to his father. On this his father threw down a stone from the heavens, which became land. Another account of the origin of the earth states that in answer to Tuli's complaint of want of a resting place, Tangaloa fished up a large stone from the bottom of the sea with a fish hook. Having raised the stone to the surface, he gave it to his son for his dwelling place. On going thither to take possession of his new home, Tuli found that every wave or swell of the ocean partially overflowed it, which compelled him to hop from one part to another of the stone, 
to prevent his feet being wetted by each succeeding wave. Annoyed at this, he returned to the skies to complain to his father, who, by a second application of the mighty fish hook, raised the land to the desired height. This version is also given by the inhabitants of other groups in Polynesia. This tradition also gives the history of the worm of the earth. Papa Taoto, the reclining rock, was succeeded by Papa Sosolo, the spreading rock. Papa Sosolo was succeeded by Papa Nofo, the sitting rock. Papa Nofo was succeeded by Papa Tu, the upright rock. The rock was succeeded by the earth or mold, Oleeleele, which was then spread over with grass, Ona Uficia Ailea Oleeleele Elemutia. After this, the Fue, convolvulus, grew and overcame the grass. Tuli returned to his father, Tangaloa, having obtained his land, but there was no man to reside on it. His father said to him, You have got your land. What grows on it? Tuli answered, The Fue, convolvulus. His father told him to go and pull it up, which he did, and on its rotting produced two grubs, Ilu, which moved a little as Tuli looked upon them when he again returned to the skies to his father, that he might tell him of their birth. Upon this, Tuli was told to return to the earth and take with him Tang Aloa Tosi, or Nai Tosi, or as he was also called, Nai the Marker, and Tang Aloa Va'ava'ai, Tang Aloa the Seer, Nai Va'ava'ai, Nai the Seer, or Beholder, who were told to operate upon the two grubs. On their arrival, they began to form them into the shape of men, commencing at the head, Ulu. When the head was completed, Tuli said, Let my name be joined with that of the head, a portion of which was then named Ole Tuli Ulu. They then proceeded to give sight by forming the eyes, when Tuli made the same request as before, upon which a portion of the eye was called Ole Tuli Mata. The tradition goes on to describe the different members of the body which were successively formed, each having the name of Tuli prefixed to the portion of the body as formed as the elbow, O Letuli Lima, and the knee, O Letuli Vai. On the formation of the two bodies being complete, they lived, but were both males, and dwelt on the land on which they were formed. One day, whilst fishing with a net called the Fa'a Mutu, one of them was injured by a small fish called the Io, which caused his death. Upon this, Tuli returned to the skies, and bewailed the loss of one of the inhabitants of his land to his father. When Naitozi was directed by Tang Aloa to proceed to the earth and reanimate the dead body, previously to which, however, he changed the sex of the deceased male to that of a female. The two then became man and wife and the parents of the human race. In connection with this history of Tangaloa, it may be mentioned that occasional visits are stated to have been made to the abode of the August Tangaloa by parties from the earth, who returned with some useful benefaction from the deity. As, for instance, Losi, who is reputed to have been the benefactor of his countrymen by bringing Taro. The deified spirits of deceased persons of rank appear to have comprised another order of spiritual beings, the more exalted of whom were supposed to become posts in the house or temple of the gods at Pulotu. Many beautiful emblems were chosen to represent their immortality, as some of the heavenly bodies such as Li'i, the Pleiades, Tupualengase, Jupiter, also Nuanua, the rainbow, and Laomaomao, the marine rainbow, with many others. The embalmed bodies of chiefs of rank, or those who had been fa'atualala'ina, made into sun-dried gods, were also reverenced under the title of tupua. The third order included all the many deities whose aid was invoked by the different orders of priests, and who were included in the general term of Aitu. These comprised war gods, family gods, those invoked by prophets and sorcerers, as well as the tutelar deities of the various trades and employments. Some of them, as Savia Seuleo and Nafanua, were stated to be the more immediate descendants of the gods and to have their residence in Pulotu, over which place the former was said to preside. These two were the national gods of war, but in addition to these were many other war gods invoked by different settlements, as local war gods, of which may be mentioned Moso, Sepo Malosi, Eye Tuipava, and Letamafainga. The same gods were also invoked by family priests. Moso, Olenifoloa, Longtooth, and Itanata 
appear to have been regarded as vindictive spirits, and to be cursed with their maledictions was looked upon as a calamity. One or two of the names given to the Ayat II thus invoked would seem to have been chosen to illustrate the manner in which their vengeance was shown. Pupu Itoto, meaning spitting blood, and Lipi Ola, meaning sudden death, may be given as illustrations. These spiritual beings were supposed to enter into the priests representing them, and to make known their commands through them. But they were also considered as accustomed to take the form of certain objects, as birds, fish, reptiles, as well as at times the human form, in which latter case they were represented as possessing the various passions incident to fallen humanity. This belief at times enabled erring mortals to cloak over their delinquencies by attributing them to the gods. Many a faithless wife and many a murderer have secured themselves from punishment in this manner. As every settlement has its local god of war in addition to the national war gods, so every family has its own particular Aitu, or tutelary deity, who was usually considered to inhabit some familiar object. One family supposed their god to possess a shark, another, some bird or a stone, and another, a reptile. Thus a great variety of objects, animate and inanimate, were reverenced by the Samoans. Their feelings with respect to these guardian deities do not appear to have been very sensitive, as although the members of one family were accustomed to regard a given object, say a shark, with superstitious reverence as their family god, they were continually seeing the same fish killed and eaten by others around them. In the case of local or district war gods, the entire district were careful to protect their chosen object of reverence from insult. Still, it often happened that if the gods were not propitious to their suppliants, torrents of abuse were heaped upon them. But, as a rule, the chosen deities were much dreaded. Many of these gods were supposed to dwell in the Fafa, or else in Salafei, whilst others ruled in Pulotu. Olafafa, Salafei, and Pulotu are places which occupy a prominent position in Samoan mythology and seem in some manner to be connected the one with the other. Olafafa, Hades, is alike the entrance to Salafei, the Samoan Tartarus, or dread place of punishment, and also to Pulotu, the abode of the blessed, the one entrance being called Olalua Loto Oali, or deep hole of chiefs, by which they pass to Pulotu the other Ola Lua Loto O Tau Fanua, or Deep Hole of the Common People, by which they pass to Lenu O Nonoa, or the Land of the Bound, which is simply another term for the much-dreaded Salafei. The idea of the superiority of the chiefs over the common people was thus perpetuated, none but chiefs or higher ranks gaining entrance to the Samoan Elysium. Speaking of the condition of the dead, an old chief of Savai'i once told me that there were supposed to be two places to which they went the one called Ole Nu'u Oayetu, or Land of Spirits, the other Ole Nu'u O Nonoa, the Land of the Bound, their bondage being superintended by such vindictive spirits as Moso, Ita Ngata, and other deities who hold sway there, whilst the significant name itself is, I think, simply another name for Salafei. It is interesting to notice how much this name Olafei is mixed up with Samoan mythology, whether as the name of a renowned war god and deity, or as Salafei, the much dreaded regions below, as also with a mysterious building of the distant past known as Olafale Olafei, the house of the Fei, the ruins of which still remain as mute witnesses of a bygone worship of which the Samoans now have no knowledge or record whatever, save the name. All these facts point to it as a name of deep significance and meaning in the history of the past, whether in connection with the history of the ancestors of the present race of Samoans, or, as many think, with the records of an earlier but long since extinct race. A halo of mystery and romance seems thrown around the name which has been selected as the name of the war god of Aana, Olafehe, Octopus. At some future time, light may be thrown upon the subject, but at present all seems mysterious. The disembodied spirit was supposed to retain the exact resemblance of its former self, and immediately on leaving the body, it was believed to commence its solitary journey to the Fafa, which was located to the westward of Savai, the most westerly of the group, and towards this point disembodied spirits from all the islands bent their way immediately after death. Thus, in case of a spirit commencing its journey at Manua, 
the most easterly of the group, it journeyed on to the western end of that island from whence it started, where it dived into the sea and swam to the nearest point of Tutuila, where, having journeyed along the shore to the extreme west point of that island, it again plunged into the sea and pursued its solitary way to the next island, and thus onward throughout the entire group, until it reached the extreme west point of Savai, the most westerly island, where it finally dived into the ocean and pursued its solitary way to the mysterious Fafa. At the west point of Upolu, the land terminates in a narrow rocky point, which is still known as Ole Fatu o Sophia, the Leaping Stone, from which all spirits were said to leap into the sea en route to the Fafa. This was a much dreaded point, where the lonely travelers were said to be certainly met with, and their company was anything but desired. I well remember the astonishment expressed at the daring courage of a man I well knew who, after he became a Christian, built his house upon this haunted point. Many times natives have assured me that disembodied spirits have passed them on the road when traveling. When asked how they knew them, they answered, Why, we knew them personally and spoke to them, but received no answer, which was quite sufficient in their estimation to determine the spiritual nature of the parties met. Since it is the invariable custom of the Samoans to return an answer when accosted on a journey, to do otherwise being looked upon as an insult. The war clubs of renowned warriors, Anava, were regarded with superstitious veneration by the different members of their families. Prior to an engagement, various rites and ceremonies were observed towards the war clubs, which were considered essential to their owners' success in battle. I have often seen battered and blood-stained war clubs treasured up and reverenced as articles of the highest value by natives, who resisted for a long time all attempts to purchase them, even at a high price, as they considered that in parting with them all hopes of success in battle went with the club. The family of Fatavolo, an old Monono chief and renowned warrior, for a long time resisted my efforts to purchase their father's war club, Otama Matene, boys and girls, so called from the number of poor children he had slain with this club during his many midnight attacks upon defenseless villages and settlements. At length, some time after his death, I was enabled to purchase this relic and deposit it in the London Missionary Society's museum on my return to England in 1846. The soul is termed Ananga in a general sense, but Atamai is also sometimes used for the mind. But this latter word more properly expresses wisdom, cleverness, instinct, or skill in manufacturing. Moli is also a term occasionally used for the spiritual portion of a man, but in a restricted sense. In case a man had been very much startled, he would say, My Mauli, or spirit, has been startled. Wasenga lo u Mauli. In this connection, it may also mean, My heart is startled. The priesthood, Taula Aitu, anchors of the spirits, from Taula, an anchor, and Aitu, spirits or gods, were divided into four classes vis a vis priests of the war gods, keepers of the war gods, family priests, and prophets or sorcerers. When the Taula Aitu o Aitu Tau, anchors of the priests of the war gods, were important personages, being consulted upon all warlike occasions. This class invoked the assistance of various war gods, but most of all Nafanua, a female deity who was reverenced by the entire population, and who in conjunction with Savea Seuleo may be considered the national gods of war. In addition to these, however, each district had its own war god. It was one of this class, the representative of Letama Fainga, that usurped the regal power of the islands and reigned with great tyranny over the whole of Samoa until the year 1829, when he was slain by the people of Aana. He was worshipped as combining both regal and divine attributes, O Tausi Aitutau, keepers of the war gods, or as they were also called, O Vafatau O Aitutau, warships of the war gods, next claim our attention. To their custody were committed the objects supposed to be inspired by the district war gods. These emblems of the gods' presence were various and had different names. The fleets of Monono were accompanied by two of such symbols, Limulimuta and Samalulu, the former a kind of drum, and the latter a long pennant that floated at the masthead of the sacred canoe. In the Tuamasanga, it consisted of the Pu, or sacred conch shell, which was named O Aitulangi, gods of the heavens, 
The same symbol was used by the people of Matautu or Savai'i. Whilst at Fangaloa, in Atua, the object of reverence was called Ole Atua, the god, and resembled a large box or chest, which was placed upon the canoe of the priest and accompanied the fleet to battle. Another emblem used by the people of the latter place took the form of a broom or besom, which was carried like the broom of Van Tromp at the masthead of the war priest's canoe. The poo, or sacred conch shell, was carried by the war priest or keeper of the god when the Tuamasanga were engaged in warfare, but the other emblems were only taken in canoes. In connection with the well-known fact that in Polynesia the poo, or conch shell, was regarded as a sacred emblem of the war god, I may mention a remarkable instance of one having been found by the late Mr. H. B. Sterndale of Samoa, in some Cyclopean remains placed on a cromlech in an extraordinary mountain burial place in the district of La Tuamasanga. In the midst of these remains, he came upon an inner chamber or cell about ten feet square. The floor was of flat stones, the walls of enormous blocks of the same placed on end. The roof was of intertwisted trunks of the banyan tree, which had grown together into a solid arch. In the center was a cromlech, about four feet high, formed of several stones arranged in a triangle with a great flat slab on the top. Upon it was what appeared to be another small stone, but which on examination proved to be a great conch shell, white with age and encrusted with moss and dead animalculae. This strange relic of the distant past had evidently been placed on the cromlech as a sacred relic as was the common custom in bygone days at the time of the burial of the occupant of this mysterious tomb, whether king or priest none could tell. But certain it is that it was someone of great renown amongst the people of his day. O Taula Aitu O Ainga, anchors of gods of families or priests of families, are the next class to be noticed. These summoned the aid of various gods such as Moso, Ita Ingata, Sepo Malosi, Ole Ali Tumanga, Ole Tamafainga. This office was also sometimes held by the head of the family or his sister. If held by the former, it gave him great power and authority over the different branches of his family, which he seldom failed to make use of in the acquisition of wealth. It was also found very convenient to dedicate property to the family god, either canoes or valuable mats, as in that case the articles could never be given away or parted with although they might be used occasionally by the Taula Aitu himself. Some one of the aforenamed deities was selected by a family as the object of their veneration, and at certain times the god was supposed to enter into the Taula Aitu, or priest, to answer inquiries or deliver demands. The approach or presence of the god was indicated by the priest commencing to gape, yawn, and clear his throat. But at length his countenance and body underwent violent contortions, after which, in loud, unearthly tones, the visitor from the land of spirits was heard announcing his approach to the terrified inmates of the house, who sat silent and trembling at respectful distances from the priest. Perhaps the god worshipped by the family was Moso, and upon the announcement, I am Moso, I am just arrived from the land of spirits to visit you, one of the elders of the party present answered, with much fear and reverence, Approach! We are your subjects, and are here waiting to receive your commands. Which address to the ghostly visitor was always made in the highest chief's language. At the close of these introductory speeches, the occasion of the visit was made known. Perhaps this was to utter a complaint of carelessness in bringing donations of food and property, accompanied with severe threats of vengeance if a liberal supply was not speedily brought to his representative or perhaps the god's anger was directed against some unfortunate who had been treasuring up a valuable mat, the existence of which had been known to the speaker and the possessor was threatened with quick punishment if the said mat were not immediately forthcoming. At other times the god announced it to be his pleasure that the entire family should assemble and build him a large canoe or a house, which command was always obeyed with alacrity, and a humble apology tendered for past neglect. Or it might be that the god was summoned, and his assistance implored in effecting the recovery of some sick person placed before him. On such occasions it was often announced that there was no immediate danger, but that recovery was retarded in consequence of the meanness of the sick person's more immediate relatives, and intimation given that a valuable mat was left behind. At other times the patient, 
although perhaps in a dying state, was directed to take plenty of food, and those who accompanied the sick person, if brought from a distance, were told to send immediately to their land for such food, or seek it amongst relatives. And they were told to see especially that there was no lack of pigs. Sometimes the patient recovered, and the fame of the cure was noised far and near. But if after all death ensued, and the more immediate friends ventured to expostulate with the god for his cruelty in taking from them one of their small number, and not going to a more numerous family, they were coolly told by the god that the deceased died in consequence of his having been overpowered by the Aitu of the family on the mother's side. O Taula Aitu Vavalo Mafaitui, anchors of the gods to predict and curse or prophets and sorcerers, from Vavalo to prophesy and Faitui to curse. This class of the priesthood invoked the assistance of the following Aitu, Tito Uso, Pupu Itoto, Spitting Blood, Lipi Ola, Sudden Death, and many others. Their services were sought after by persons who had been robbed or otherwise injured, and who sought to know the spot where the stolen articles were hidden, as also who was the thief or cause of the injury or curse that was supposed to have fallen upon them. They were also consulted by persons who sought to revenge themselves on others, and asked that curses might be uttered upon parties who were specially named. The sick were also taken to the Taula Aitu, and they were consulted as to the occasion of the sickness and probable issue. At the same time, they were besought to invoke the aid of the gods in the removal of the disease. In return for these services, they received large presents of food and valuable property. All the different orders of the priesthood possessed great influence over the minds of the people, who were kept in constant fear by their threats and impoverished by their exactions. This remark applies more particularly to the two latter classes, although frequent offerings were made by the people to their war gods, with which the priests, or Taula Aitu, failed not to enrich themselves. There would seem to have been a strong resemblance between this class of priests and the Maori Tohunga with their much dreaded incantations. Some Aitu, principally the war gods, but not entirely so, were honored with dwellings called Fale Aitu, spirit houses, as also Olamalumalu Ole Aitu, the dwelling or temple of the Aitu. Whether a house or a tree, one or more of which of some description were usually found in every village. These spirit houses were built in the usual shape and style, with nothing in their build or finish to distinguish them from other dwellings, being at times mere huts, but rendered sacred by their being set apart as the dwelling place of the god, and hence regarded with much veneration by the Samoans in the olden times. So much so, that for a considerable period after the arrival of Europeans amongst them, they were accustomed to view with much jealousy any intrusion upon their sacred precincts. They were placed in charge of the keepers of the war gods, who, in addition to their titles given elsewhere, were also called Va'afa'atan o Aitu Tau warships of the war gods. Whatever emblems of deity were in possession of the village were always placed in these houses and under the watchful care of these keepers. When the priests of the war gods were consulted professionally, they were accustomed to go to these houses for the purpose of advising with the god, who was supposed to enter into the priest as well as the particular emblems of the deity in case any were deposited in the temple, and then deliver his answer to the proposed question. These spirit houses, or Malumalu Ole Aitu, were usually placed in the principal Malay of the village, surrounded with a low fence, and were built of similar materials to those used in ordinary dwellings. They were almost always placed on fanatanu, or raised platforms of stones, varying in height and dimensions, according to the amount of respect felt towards the presiding god of the temple by those who erected them. These platforms were always made, and the Malumalu, or spirit house, built by the united exertions of a whole family, village, or district, as the case might be. One very interesting exception to the usual style of building these temples is found in the case of a remarkable old ruin of the Fale Olefehe, House of the Fehe, the famous war god of Aana and Faleata, the site of which became known to a short time before leaving Samoa in 1845. This appears to have been built in the usual Samoan style, but its ruins disclose the fact that its builders had used stone slabs for the supporting posts of the roof, and thus it got the name of Olafale Ma Olafehe, the stone house of the Fehe. 
and hence became enshrouded with much mystery and wonder. I think this is the only instance of such a departure from the usual style of Samoan building known in the islands. Various localities were supposed to be the haunts of different Aitu, or spirits. On the road leading from Falalatai to Lafanga, there is a gap in a mountaintop washed by the rains through which the road passes, and which was said to have been formed by repeated blows from the club of a vindictive spirit who had taken up his residence there and was continually assaulting traveling parties as they passed. I have often been entertained, whilst passing this spot, with the recital of the various hairbreadth escapes of parties from the assaults of this tyrant. On the different roads throughout the islands, spots are still pointed out as places which were formerly regarded with dread as the abode of some Aitu, and on passing which every person was accustomed to make some small offering, accompanied with a petition for a prosperous journey. Sometimes a tree acquired sacredness and renown from its being the gathering place of spirits. Even as late as the year 1844, I was much surprised one day to see an old blind man laboring to cut down a beautiful and very ornamental tree that stood near his house, and which till then had afforded him shelter from both heat and storm. I remonstrated with him for destroying so great an ornament to his land when he told me that it was the resort of an Aitu who disturbed him greatly with his doings and that by cutting the tree down he hoped he should be rid of his torment and thus get peace. On my return, some little time after, I found the man had succeeded in cutting down the obnoxious tree, near to which he sat, and told me with evident pleasure he hoped to get quiet nights for the future. As of late his rest had been sadly disturbed by the Aitu and his visitors. In the olden days, such an act of summary ejectment and daring impiety would never have been thought of or entertained for a moment. The dispositions attributed to their Aitu and Sawali by the Samoans varied considerably, some being considered playful and mischievous, other vindictive, whilst some again were reputed to be of mild and inoffensive temper. The playful or frolicsome Aitu were said to disturb the peace of some quiet family at their evening meal with unearthly noises or sounds. Or perhaps, just as the last flickering flame passed from their wood fire, the company would be startled by the arrival of Aitu in the shape of a dull-colored ball of fire, which flitted from rafter to rafter, or passed along the ridgepole, and then took his departure amidst the uproar and clatter made by the affrighted inmates of the dwelling, who rushed helter-skelter out of the house, at other times taking the form of a man and feeling disposed for a ride. The Aitu terrified some poor benighted traveler by leaping on his back and nearly choking him while he continued to ride on in this fashion. Resistance was vain, and the terrified traveler marched along in silence, but with hair on end, until his tormentor released his hold and left him to pursue his journey in peace. This love of a ride on the part of the playful spirits was said on one occasion to have enabled a party of visitors to compass the destruction of one who had long been a terror to the neighborhood, as he haunted a particular spot, to the dread of all passers-by. These details were given me by an old orator of Mulinu'u, who seemed convinced of the reality of the whole proceeding, which he declared had actually happened a few years before the details were narrated to me, and also that he knew the man who had carried the Aitu, a daredevil fellow whom I also knew, and who was cruel.